Well, let me just tell you, this is a very surreal moment. All of you know way more about astronomy than I do. I've only been a member for a year, so the fact that I even have something to tell you is pretty unfathomable. <laughs> um, I'm sure you know most of what I'm going to talk about, but hey. So, um, whoops. my name is Aditya. Uh, for those, most of you don't know, probably don't know me. I'm 18 years old. Uh, I've moved to the UK three years, three years ago. I've kind of lived all over the world. This is the fifth country I've lived in. Um, and uh, later this year, I'm going to be going to university here where I'm going to be studying computer science. Uh, I go to an international school here in the UK with people from over 60 countries. And we follow this curriculum called the IB Diploma Program, the International Baccalaureate. Now, there's a lot of elements and much of it is a waste of time to tell you about. But, there, but I'm here to tell you about one uh, aspect of it. And it's called the, oh, thank you very much. That's uh, it's called the extended essay. And these two words, extended essay, strike fear and dread into the heart of every IB student in the world. <laughs> so what is it? It's a 4,000 word academic dissertation on a research question of our choice and a subject of our choice. And some of you may be thinking, what, a 17, 18 year old writing a 4,000 word essay? That's so huge. Honestly, I would have preferred if it was seven to 10,000 words instead. 4,000 is nothing. And the reason it strikes so much dread is because it's not just an essay, it's a mini PhD. We go through these five, whoops, we go through these five stages of extended essay pain, where we get assigned to a supervisor, we pick a topic, we go through months and months of research, we write down our findings, and we even reflect and do a viva voce. So it really is a mini PhD compressed into a nine month time frame. So I thought about all the different things I'd want to do, and I decided to write mine in physics, because everyone said never write one in math. And <laughs> there, were all these, you know, there, there were all these cool ideas that I came up with, but I couldn't do any of them because they all required equipment like the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva. <laughs> so I had to focus on something simple. And then it hit me. Wait a second. I go to this astronomy club once a month, Maybe there's something in astrophysics I can do. And after going through about six different topics, I eventually realized that there were three questions I had that I wanted to answer. And I know I could find the answers to these through a quick Google search, but I wanted to try doing it myself from scratch. So my first question was, what's inside a star, right? They all look really pretty, but what's inside them? What kinds of elements are made up of them? The second question I had was, how hot is a star, right? They're pretty bright, they must be pretty hot, hotter than my oven, I'm sure. So, how hot exactly do they get? And number three, how fast does a star move? Like, we know that it goes in a retrograde motion through the sky, but these are, of course, moving in space itself. So, how fast is it moving? And I wanted a way to find this out through an experiment, because they told me that experiments score better than mooshing off NASA's data. So, I thought, okay, well, um, there's seven spectral classes out there, right? O, B, A, A F, G, K, M. Uh, why don't I pick one from each and calculate all those three things, the, the elements inside, how hot they are, how fast they're moving, and compare them with one another. So these are, uh, these are the stars that I selected. And to find the answers to these questions, it lay in a really fascinating and painful discipline called spectroscopy. And after nine months of pain, blood, sweat, and tears, I was finally able to uh, finish my paper and my clicker is not working. And uh, this, is the, this is the front page of my paper, all 52 pages of it. Um, okay, so what is spectroscopy? Well, it's all about the study of spectra. Now, these spectra are formed by looking how electrons and atoms behave. So this is the Bohr model of an atom. We have a positively charged nucleus in the center, and surrounding it and orbiting it are these electrons. But they sit and occupy these sit in and occupy these discrete energy levels, right? They don't just float around randomly all over the place. And what, as it turns out, if I pass electromagnetic radiation towards the atom, the electron is going to absorb it, and it's going to get excited, and it's going to jump up energy levels. But it can't stay excited for long because it's an unstable state. So what happens is, after a little bit of time, it jumps back down to a lower energy level, and it releases. A disc uh, this uh, electromagnetic ra radiation at a discrete wavelength. And if we look at what's in the, at the wavelengths of light emitted, we see that they only exist at specific uh, discrete points. So these are the, uh, the elements, uh, the atoms of a bunch of elements, and you can see that 
uh, for each of the corresponding wavelengths, some lines show up. But what about from a star? What if, what if I want to know what elements are in a star? And, and you can find all kinds of information from the spectrum. Well, as you're seeing the light coming in from a star, let's say there's a cloud of gas or dust between you, the observer, and the star itself. Well, what's going to happen is as that light travels, the electrons inside the gas and dust are going to absorb this radiation and they're going to jump up. But because that only happens at discrete values, the rest of the light is going to come through. And what we get instead is this thing called an absorption spectrum, where we have the full continuous spectrum, but then we have these dark bands here in the middle. And that's what those electrons have absorbed and gone up by. And just to sort of give you a comparison, uh, you're, we have a boring continuous spectrum there, which I guess is pretty colors, but doesn't really tell us anything. And then we have the emission spectrum I mentioned, and the absorption spectrum I also mentioned. And if you notice, they're actually mirror images of it. They're actually the inverses of each other. Now, I'm going to let you in on a little secret, uh, which you probably actually already know. If you begin to uh, add more and more of these energy levels, and you start to number them, 0, 1, 2, increasing as you go out, what you find is that when an electron jumps down to the second energy level, it releases visible light. And because it releases visible light in that transition, we can use optical instruments with stars to figure out, uh, to figure out the spectra and answer some of those questions. So how do you do it? Well, one of the instruments you can use is a, something called a diffraction grating. And this is the one I use. It's called the Star Analyzer 100. And the way a diffraction grating works, if you don't know, is it has a lot of lines or slits on it. Uh, this particular one has 100 slits per millimeter. So there, there are a lot of them, they're parallel and they're closely packed. And what happens is the light travels down, and as it passes through the slit, it diffracts. But you have other incident light waves as well, they're also diffracting at the same time. So all these waves interfere with each other, and they create points of mi maximum and minimum intensity. And so if you hold this, uh, uh, this way, I borrowed Alan's uh, grading, he was very, very kind to lend it to me. And if you hold up the uh, grading to a light source, you can see that you, you see these patterns start to appear, these regions of maximum and minimum intensity. You can't really see it that well. So, great, I have a way of looking at pretty colors. How do I translate that into something meaningful with the stars that I want to look at? You use a camera. So I went out and I bought a uh, T-ring and a nose piece adapter, and I fitted it on the grating, and it was all great, and I was ready to go. And then I took my telescope out. Now, this is a very... Uh, lame telescope compared to the one back there. This doesn't hold a candle to any of Percy's telescopes. But it's a pretty basic and... <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was hoping that it could do the job. So I plugged in my camera, I got really excited, I put it at the star I wanted, I clicked a picture, and this is what I got. <laughs> now if you're wondering... <laughs> I'll tell you what <laughs> Yeah, so nothing. And I tried varying uh, how it's plugged in, I tried varying the star I was pointed at, tried varying the balance, I tried everything, and I kept getting this image. Deeply, deeply frustrating. And even when I was looking at the, the star in the live view, nothing was showing up. So, frustrating. So, okay, I, uh, I, I decided to phone a friend, and I sent out an email to the society, some of you may have seen it last summer, uh, and Tim responded, and he agreed to let me, and he had some experience imaging, so he agreed to let me use his telescope with him, uh, to try to capture the spectrum of these stars. So I went over to Tim's house, and my mind was immediately blown because he has an observatory. And for any of you who have an observatory, this is instant street cred for anyone who knows you. Because the next day I went to my friends and I was like, dude, check it out. I was at somebody's house and they have an observatory. And they started worshiping me like God. So, <laughs> Really, really cool stuff. <laughs> Unfortunately, I had to give credit to Tim, and I, I couldn't just say it was my telescope. <laughs> but uh, as you can see, uh, we, we got the, the camera plugged in, we had it uh, pointed at the right star. I had to cut half, that, that star list I mentioned earlier, that went through like 10 revisions because of trees, clouds, and just generally crappy English weather. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we tried this, and, if, and we clicked a picture, and I was so enthusiastic, but once again, we got a blank image. And then I got terrified. Oh no, I'm going to fail the essay. And if I fail the essay, I fail my entire diploma. 
So, and then I don't go to university and I get a bad job and my life is ruined. So, you can imagine the stress on me. But then we started varying the distance between the camera and the, sen the sensor of the camera and the telescope itself. And eventually, we got this. <laughs> so, this is a Vega right here, and uh, that, that is its spectrum produced. Uh, it depends how you actually focus it. So sometimes we got three spectra showing up, and then when, only when we started focusing that we got this main first order spectrum. Here's another one. This is Mira. Uh, you can't really see it, but on my computer screen, this the star is pretty reddish because it's a class M star, and we know that those are reddish. And it's and it's orientated differently because that's where the telescope was pointing, and I couldn't be bothered to rotate it. <laughs> Sorry. So now we got the spectrum. How do we answer these questions? Well, we could sit and do a bunch of fancy math that nobody knows how to do by hand, or we could use computer software. Yeah. So that's exactly what I did. So what is the star made of? So I plugged it, I, I put the uh, image of the spectrum into the computer software, and how it works is it looks at each pixel value and it pulls it apart and assembles it into this nice curve, like so. Like so. <laughs> that's really right. There we go. So um, this is a this is the spectrum after calibrating it. Uh, if anyone does know what angstroms are, that's basically uh, 10 nanometers, or actually wait, 0.1 nanometers. That's what it is. 10 times 10 to the uh, 10, 10 to the power of negative 10 meters. Um, and these units, I got very excited about what these units were. When me it turns out they're just arbitrary. Um, so I started to try to figure out what kinds of elements were present in the star based on the spectrum. And the way I did it was I took out this huge star atlas, which I had in PDF form, of course. Uh, and what turns out, some very smart scientists uh, figured out that specific wavelengths of light correspond to specific elements. So you see, wherever here in this graph there is an absorption dip, like right here, for example, that probably corresponds to an element. So I would go through the, the star atlas and see, is that wavelength, whatever that is, it's, what, let's say, 4,300 angstroms, is, is there a wavelength in the star chart, uh, a star atlas, that corresponds to an element at that position? It turns out there is, and that's called, and it's called, uh, it's, a, it's a type of hydrogen, it's called hydrogen gamma. And this is part of the hydrogen bolomer series. And I was able to figure out a bunch of other elements using that same procedure, like hydrogen delta, uh, oxygen, hydrogen beta, iron, and calcium. Here's another example, a more refined example. This is from Miroc, that class M star I mentioned earlier. I found some weird chemicals here, so I thought I was wrong, but hey, I can always talk about that in my evaluation. So I found a titanium oxide, a vanadium oxide, magnesium, and oxygen. Although I must say, this oxygen was pretty dodgy, because if you look, there's a lot of noise here before and after the, the spectrum peaks. But if I only had three elements, my experiment would not look that great, so I decided to just kind of fudge the results and throw that in there. <laughs> That's what science is about. It's about you know, doing the genuine stuff where you can and fudging the rest. <laughs> okay. And uh, here it is summarizing it for all the other stars that I looked at. So if you see some of them, have, uh, like Vega, have a lot of elements that I was able to identify, and others were seriously lacking like Markov. Uh, maybe I could have found more, but it was honestly really hard. And in some elements, I was really looking where there were no absorption dips. I was just looking for some inconsistency in the graph so that I have something to write about. And so these are some of the elements that, you know, are narrow in stars. And I, I like to quote Carl Sagan here, who said once that we are all made of stardust. And, you know, so and many of these elements are present in the human body, the rest are present on Earth. So I think it's a very apt quote from Carl. Second question. How hot is the star? So I did a bunch of data processing which involved correcting for the errors in my camera. And in the end, I got this thing called a Planck curve, which I still don't really know what it is, but the guy who made the software, Tom Field, told me that that's what I should be going for. <laughs> so uh, this is a better look at the interface of the software. So here, uh, I've basically squeezed the star and its spectrum on the, uh, uh, on the left hand side. Actually, I forgot to mention something. If I go back here, uh, this peak right here is the star itself. So we tend to ignore that, and we only tend to look at this, uh, this other peak here, which, which is more indicative of the elements inside. So back here, uh, I've done all this data processing, which has resulted in some weirdly noisy data right there. Uh, but I've got this Planck curve. 
Now, there's two ways I can calculate the temperature. I'm going to tell you about one. Uh, and that is by finding a curve of best fit uh, from this reference library. So they had a bunch of temperature curves, and I basically tried to find the one that, that corresponded the best with this graph. And you can see it says 10,100 Kelvin. In the end, that's not what I wound up using because I found that the, the, the literature value of the star was something like 8,500, and I, want to my, I wanted to minimize my error. So I tried to use a, a lower uh, temperature curve and try to hope that it would fit, and it kind of did. Um, <laughs> and in the end, what I got was this, uh, was this table. I just want to point out here, Zeta Ophiuchi, if I'm pronouncing that right, is at 30,000 Kelvin. That's insanely hot. And that ranges all the way from a class O star all the way down to a class M star that's only 3,700. That's pretty remarkable. Just the, the sheer, I, when I was looking at this data, it was pretty humbling. No, just to, just look at the sheer scale and the spread of the, the temperatures of stars. Okay, so that's the second question kind of answer. Third question is how fast is a star moving? So we use a technique, well, I say we. Uh, astronomers use a technique <laughs> called, uh, by examining redshift and blue shift to try to figure out uh, if a star is moving away from us, towards us, and how fast. So I decided to look at hydrogen gamma. Um, and I noticed that the, the value that I measured in the star itself, which was uh, which was 4345.50 angstroms, was larger than the literature value if measured on Earth in a lab, which was 4340.47, which means this star has been moving. Because as a star, let's say a star is moving away from you, right? The frequency of the light that's coming to you is getting, uh, is getting lower and lower. And so your wavelength is getting longer and longer. And as a result, it's moving to the red end of the spectrum. On the other hand, if a star is coming towards you, uh, its, uh, its, spectrum is shifting into the, its spectrum is shifting into the blue end because the wavelength is getting smaller and smaller, the frequency is getting higher and higher and higher. So I, did, I plugged in uh, these, I figured out where it showed up on my graph, did these fancy calculations, and I got this huge number of uh, 347.66 kilometers per second. Uh, and I did the math for the rest of the stars. I don't know why there's a discrepancy in the data, but I, I think I forgot to change that calculation too late now. Um, and I got, I got these huge values here. 1690.20 uh, kilometers per second. The only, uh, unfortunately, as it turns out, this is all wrong. The only thing that's right here is whether it's been blue shifted or red shifted. And even there, I was kind of cherry picking my data. But over here, all of this is wrong. In fact, the real values are like one kilometer per second, 0.6 kilometers per second. So in my evaluation, I got huge percentage errors. Uh, and it turns out that this is because the uh, star itself is, uh, sorry, the, the, the grading itself has such a low resolution that it cannot discern that level of stellar movement. So I set out on this nine month journey with these three ridiculous questions for an 18 year old to ask experimentally. What's inside a star? How hot is it? How fast is the star moving? And I, thought, I honestly thought that it would be pretty straightforward and easy from the onset, but roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. Finally, I was able to submit my paper uh, three days ago. It finally got sent off to be marked by an anonymous examiner who won't care about me at all. <laughs> uh, but I honestly, I honestly could not have done it without the help of two people in the society. The first is the gentleman standing right here, and that's Tim. He allowed me to use his telescope. Without you, Tim, this paper would not even be uh, incomplete, it would be non-existent. So thank you so much for that. And also Alan, who was super kind to lend his grading to me. And as a result, I was actually able to get some data. And I'd like to leave you with an image. Um, okay, the image is one of the <coughs> All right. So on the last day of uh, imaging with uh, Tim, uh, we took this picture. And uh, this is the ring nebula right here. Uh, and all these rainbow lines you see are the spectrum of all the stars surrounding it. Uh, and this green circle here and this red circle is basically the emission spectrum of the ring nebula. And uh, Tim did some analysis on that one and was able to point out the elements. I think it was oxygen and hydrogen, if I remember right. Something like that. But just a beautiful picture that I want to leave you with. Thank you so much for having me. Questions I can